Excellent. For okay. the love of God, for the love of God, neighbor and country. Thanks yes. for tuning in. Well, so, go ahead. I was just going to welcome everybody, but please, you go ahead. I'll step back. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, are you sure? Yeah. Okay. I don't want to, you know, if you're on a roll there. Um, if not, uh, I just want to welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Sarah Carell, Power of the Store, founder of The Power of Our Story. And today we are celebrating Independence Day. We are coming together and just having uh, a conversation about what we appreciate, um, just about our freedoms, our strengths. And we're doing this by having veterans and first responders, a uh, big uh, storytelling jam session. That's what we're calling this day. It's uh, um, all day storytelling group facilitated all to celebrate our Independence Day. And uh, so right now uh, we have, uh, it, we're calling this time our group. It's for the love of God, neighbor and country. And uh, Joel Landy, um, he was a lieutenant in the United States Navy. Uh, he, his job was uh, aviation physiology and water survival training. Uh, he leads this group, which is a faith-based group for fellowship and sharpening our faith. And we normally have this weekly and we call the group where mission and faith belong. And I cannot tell you how much we appreciate you, Joel. Thank you so much for coming weekly and it's just been a great group of depth. I think you have led such great discussions. Um, they're, they're very deep, very rich, thought provoking, um, and very inspirational. So thank you, Joel. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Well, God is good. Uh, I think the word is powerful. The word is enough and, uh, God's spirit has led us in some great directions. And so, um, what we provide today is just really a free flowing conversation within our fellowship. So if you're visiting and you're watching this, we meet every week, we meet for an hour. Uh, we talk about the scripture. We sometimes pray at the beginning of the end, but really we've created a space for people that either want to renew their faith or want to build their faith. Uh, and we're looking like today, you know, the country's turning 245 years old on Sunday. And we today are just wanting to look at that through the lens of the Christian faith. And uh, so it's a free flowing conversation. It's not scripted. At first, we had this idea that we were going to talk about a parable, and then I pulled the plug, and I said, you know what, let's just talk about whatever is on your heart or, or something that God puts on your heart, and that's what we want to do today. We want to look at why we celebrate every 4th of July, but today is through the lens of the Christian faith, and so before we begin, I'm going to ask Tony Ball if he would lead us just in a short prayer, and then I'm going to guide us through some thoughts, and then we're going to have interactive conversation, so please jump in uh it's a free-flowing thing there's there's no bad answers there's no bad questions but we really want to engage the conversation and and just really leave here feeling like we've we've gained something from being together so tony are you still there are you manicuring your beard i am here uh yeah i, I spent three hours on it this morning i think that's enough um so i'm i'm all present for the prayer let's go ahead and bow our heads Lord, thank you for uh, letting us be here today to really create um, the world around us, the environment, and especially this space, uh, that we appreciate Sarah so much uh, for opening this up, um, but that you have the allowance uh, within um, just the, the gifts that you give us, and also the country that we're in, the freedom to be able to get on and um, express the things that we're expressing, that to be able to praise you openly, to be able to uh, talk about difficult issues and still love one another, as your word said. Uh, thank you for all of those things that you provided for us. I lift each and every single one of us on this call up today, uh, just that our voices are really um, shared, heard, expressed, and loved uh, amongst each other, um, but also that this message may resonate and spread. Uh, and create just a larger audience and be able to and be able to connect with many, many others and, and help them be able to see you and your creation and what you bring each and every single day. Uh, and and uh, lastly, I just want to raise up Joel, uh, that his uh, message today comes with discernment, with wisdom, and uh, just full of your grace. Um, in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Tony. So Robert Bella... Uh, was an American sociologist. He was educated at Harvard, and he taught at Berkeley. 
He wrote a book called Habits of the Heart. And in that book, he wrote this. Americans have created a culture that elevated individual choice and expression to such a level that there was no longer any shared value, no commanding truths or values that tied us together. And, you know, for me, my faith has been the element that has kept me from going off the grid and doing my own thing in a country that provide, has provided me a tremendous amount of freedom. You know, I was actually talking this morning to a friend about this idea of freedom, you know, freedom isn't free. And, you know, we were talking about the book of Galatians that, you know, in God's word, freedom has a conclusion, not in this expression of just indulging yourself, but really the capability of loving other people. And so, you know, in my diligence, which was shallow, but I looked at, you know, the founding fathers. And when we consider, as we celebrate this weekend, and I'm going to go through it through a different lens, I took it a little bit deeper this year, but I thought about the idea of life, liberty, and the pursuit you know, of happiness. And there's been debate, but a lot of people believe that those particular words were gleaned from some of the men that framed that document. Um, and so it's just interesting that 245 years later, you know, the country is in a very interesting place. And I posted on uh, Facebook, I don't think I posted on, oh, on LinkedIn too. You know, but I wondered, you know, what would the founding fathers, what kind of scores would they give us you know, if they were to measure us on what they intended it to look like, uh, which is really a great conversation. So, you know, um, I just want to open it up. You know, today's a fellowship and I've got a passage of scripture I want to read at the end. I'd like to share a little bit, a little bit, do a little bit deeper dive on what this means to me, but I don't want to get in the way of the discussion. Um, but I want to just open it up to, you know, we've all had a chance to think and pray, you know, we're looking at this celebration, this, this declaration that we're now independent and we live in this fantastic country. And just like any family, every country has problems, uh, but we live in a fantastic country. I love our country. Um, but today we choose to look at it through the lens of, of being Christians. And so I'm going to sit back and I'm going to mute my mic for a bit. Whoever wants to jump in. And again, like I said, it's a free flowing conversation. You can share a thought, and if somebody wants to respond to your thought, let's have that conversation. I already see a hand up. I don't even know if we need to have hands. I mean, let's just jump in and just literally have a conversation, and I don't think, I think we'll do fine. I don't think we're going to talk over one another, so I'm going to mic up. Well, I think uh, many of us know that myself and Papa Ron are never short of words. I think the, uh, I think the greatness that we bring to the table, uh, make sure that, that we never have uh, nothing less to say. Uh, but uh, I, I did think about this and it kind of brought me back uh, to my adolescent years. And I kind of wanted to, and I kind of thought back to um, sort of my own life lesson of, of when I was young. I used to have this statement that many people hold today. And it's just that simple statement of, I hate stupid people, you know? You go through life and there's so many different, you know, things that happen or there's there's people you run across each day or, or things that frustrate you throughout the day. And you just have this phrase stuck in your head of I hate stupid people. Um, and, and, you know, they've made T-shirts of it and everything else and all this other stuff for fun. Uh, but, you know, getting old and, and as the gray hair started to come in, it made me realize that I was missing that appreciation for the other side or the other view, you know, and, and I started thinking of it more along the lines of, wait a minute, if everybody was smart, then what would that make me, you know, so I can't be that, that other side or whatever, unless there is a, a balance, you know, to, to whatever it is, you know, I, I'm, I'm not considered, um, you know, a, a tall person, if there is no short person in the world, you know, I'm not considered, you know, one side or the other. Uh, so I, it really made me kind of look at the world in a major different lens of appreciation versus that skepticism of, you know, constantly looking at the other side or whatever as, as being that, that difference or that, that frustrating piece or that whatever it was, you know. And I think that that moment in my life to where I started to say, well, you know what, I actually do appreciate everybody regardless of where they stand, and regardless of whatever they, you know, do, even the, even the super smart people, because that gives me the goal to, to, to achieve and, and to, to grow and, and be that next person. You know, I, I can't, 
set an expectation of where I would like to be tomorrow um, without that kind of example or the, or at least that, uh, that knowledge to know that that's possible, you know? And, and so uh, it really kind of set sort of that tone to say, I have to appreciate everybody in whatever walk of life they, they put forth. And um, that translates so much more into today as well. So, if, and especially like think back to the whole kneeling for the flag uh, controversy thing that happened. Uh, and I think it was Nate, Nate Bollinger, Bollinger, I think was his name, uh, the special forces uh, guy who, who had stood up for Colin Kaepernick and wrote a letter, an open letter to the public saying, you know, hey, I appreciate that you're, you're protesting, you know, uh, that you're doing something. I may not agree with you, but I appreciate that you're exercising that right. And, and I think that, you know, kind of like what you said is what would our founding fathers sort of score us at today? They may not appreciate some of the things that we're at, but I think they would absolutely appreciate that we've given ourselves the freedom uh, to be able to hold these, these differences, uh, to be able to voice our opinions and not be prosecuted, uh, you know, to be able to, to do something that we feel might be right, although it disagrees with whatever side somebody else believes is right. Um, you know, and I think just having that freedom and that space uh, is what helps us to grow as well. You know, rather than being fit into everybody must fit this box or else you're 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 damned or condemned. Uh, you know, and and so it it obviously to to uh, bring in the the uh, faith integration part is I pulled up Romans fourteen, uh, and in Romans fourteen it talks about the strong uh, and the weak, and it, it simply says that except the ones uh, whose faith is weak, without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats any everything must not treat with contempt the one that does not, and the one that does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, uh, for God has accepted them. You are to judge, are you, who are you to judge someone else's servant? Uh, to their own master, servant stand or fall, and they will stand for the Lord is able to make them stand, you know, and so essentially, it's, it's not my place to put it out there, the Lord has accepted everybody, regardless of what side of the peace they put on, and I just truly appreciate that our country, regardless of what side of the line you might fall upon, that it really is acceptable, you know, uh, we may go at each other's throats and have our differences or whatnot, but as society as a whole, America has really set that precedence of saying, regardless of what side you stand on, you're able to voice that opinion freely uh, without prosecution. And that's all I got to say about that. I love you, Tony. Love it, Tony. All right, by the way, uh, Chris didn't bow his head when you were praying. I just rat him out right there. So. I hope he closed his eyes. At Put least him on blast. Was... He had his eyes closed, but he didn't didn't bow his head. But uh, he was probably hey, driving next guys. to a cop. So <laughs> I, you know, I, I I when when we teed this up, it was around the parable that the unnamed parable of the Good Samaritan that Joel mentioned. Uh, uh, so that parable was life changing for me with respect to God, neighbor and country. And we even back and forth this when we came up with the title of this session, uh, that that country falls beneath God and neighbor. You know, um, if this country has put itself on the line for neighbor countries. With, with many times, I mean, I literally, uh, that's, so my relationship to God and my neighbors really kind of defines how I can have capacity to love country. You know, it's like even to build that capacity. Uh, and this, the story of the Samaritan was, you know, he, you know, we know the guy fell in the ditch and the religious guys came out and walked by and the Samaritan. And in our day and age, I think there's no more compelling story than that in terms of relationship. The, the I'll say the Jews and the Samaritans were ethnic rivals. They literally were in that time. And we have, 
uh, in this time, we're, we're drilling down into ethnic rivals. And um, at the beginning of it, he said, they said, what do we got to do to go to heaven? What are the great commandments? He said, love God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself. You know, and I, I can kind of get loving God and I can sure kind of get loving me. But my neighbor sometimes, you know, I don't necessarily, you know, I've come from a, a past where, you know, covetousness was real. I mean, you know, you coveting was so real. And <clears throat> when breaking that cycle was difficult and, and the haves and the have nots and the, you know, I didn't get because they did or they got and I didn't and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, but at the end of the story, uh, after the Samaritan came by and helped the guy who had been robbed and in the ditch, uh, Jesus flipped the switch on them because uh, they said, uh, when he said the two great commandments, they asked, who's my neighbor? And he flipped the script on them at the end of the story. And he says, who was a neighbor to this man? And so that I, I, we reviewed that. At, I went to Christian Heritage College and in one of our New Testament surveys, we, we reviewed that story. And it's not about who's my neighbor, it's who I'm I a neighbor to. And our country has been a neighbor to so many countries. I mean, literally, and for good many times. And I just, I value that. I, it's like, um, and my worldview now is it's not as important who is my neighbor, whether it's next door or other door or across the street. It's who am I being a neighbor to um, in terms of serving veterans? I mean, I like serving veterans and first responders, but I like serving people who aren't. You know, it's like the, the loving the unlovely, uh, the unlovable, the reproached and the reproachable. It's like that, that defines, you know, when I can love and when I, when I have bald tires and I can rejoice in my neighbor got a new set of tires, I mean, that, that's, where, that's really where the rubber meets the road for me. Um, loving God, neighbors, and country. And if I don't love God and if I don't love my neighbors as myself, uh, I don't know that I have the capacity to really love my country. Uh, it, or I have a diminished capacity to... And just a little funny story, and I will uh, let it go now. I was working underneath my car, and I had grease all over me. And I hear this little girl voice uh, beside my truck, and it says, hello, neighbor. <laughs> and, and it was our neighbors who live in the cul-de-sac across the street. And she has on her black robe, and her hair head is all dressed. And the ladies, the mother and the family are standing at the curb. She says, I brought you something. And we have this, we have this exchange food kind of thing. So when we have something, we walk the cul-de-sac and, and the neighbors left and right. And we share some of our food with them if they want it or, or things we have. And, and they took that as a cultural thing. And now every now and then they will make something special and they'll bring and share it with me. And, um, you know, I love neighbors. I mean, I really do. Uh, we, we probably couldn't be more different, her family and my family, except that we're neighbors. And I wish the absolute best for them. You know, I really do. I pray God the absolute best for people. Uh, and I think that's where I'm going to leave it at right there is those are my neighbors. And my relationship to God is much dependent on my relationship to my neighbors and my countries is dependent on me having a good relationship with God and neighbors so that I have the capacity to better serve this country and the people around me. So let's go with that. Love it. Thank you, Ron. I have to say you guys are powerful, both of you in your stories and, uh, takes me back to a kid when I used to we used to go to Sunday school and church and I lived in very small towns and your neighbors were part of your family 
and uh, living in big cities and moving as much as we had, we had to create that amongst who was around us. And uh, yeah, thank you for sharing both those. And, and we have to remember that we're all created by the same hey. person, same thing, Thanks. same entity. You're right. Hey, neighbor. So, Hi, neighbor. Uh, so I, I left out one little important part about when it all began as a child underneath the kitchen table at, at my mother was in one of those women's clubs. Uh, we called them extension clubs, uh, county extension clubs. And they just, they're, they're do-gooders that do things and, and that. And I, I, I would be playing underneath the kitchen table. Some of my earliest memories were at an extension club. They were called the willing workers. And they would start out uh, every meeting with two things. They would sing the national anthem and then they would sing, God bless America. And uh, that, those were my earliest memories and it's, you know, my, my dad and uncles and all them were in the military. So it's no wonder that I didn't come from a, a perspective to love this country and, and, and being enamored with it. I mean, I really am enamored with this country and how a bunch of misfits could come together and do something good every now and then. It's like, I mean, I, <laughs> I was, I was mo the most unlikely soul to do anything good in the military or in life. And, and I still get to, you know, so it's like when, when you get a bunch of, you know, <laughs> I mean, you think about the military, we fight and win wars with the likes of the people that are in our military <laughs> and we can, we can be some knuckleheads and, and, um, uh, but anyways, I, I, I really do love this country and, uh, and God bless America. Hey, Ron, if I can kind of dovetail in on that, um, uh, you know, America has availed itself to helping other people across the globe. Um, we're probably the only country that's really ever done that in the history of the world, as far as we know. I mean, some of it's political, right? But it's also important to help those who are truly in need. And, and we do that. You know, it's, we have a, a huge humanitarian uh, crisis response, and it's led by our military, and it's global. And we get involved in a lot of areas. We risk our, the lives of our people to make things better in other places. We spend our treasure to do that. And there's reasons we do it, but the humanitarian aspect of that is huge, it's important. I, in 2019, in June of 2019, I went with my brother-in-law, he's a retired Army Lieutenant Colonel. We both made the trek over to Normandy for the 75th commemoration of D-Day. That's, that's a bucket list thing for me. I never thought I'd do it, but timing, it, it came together and, and I made the trip. And we walked the beaches, we saw the cliffs, we went to the battlefields, and it's just, it's awe-inspiring to think about what was happening when those men were storming the beaches, when they had to climb the cliffs, when they were getting strafed by heavy machine gun fire and artillery, when the, when the ramp dropped and, a, and an entire stick of men perished in seconds, but they kept coming and they kept coming wave after wave and they climbed the walls. They, they went through the barriers to help secure the freedom of those in Europe. And we got to talk, you know, my brother-in-law and I, you know, we keep our hair short and folks would come up to us and say, you're American, right? Did you, you served in the military? And well, yes, we did. It was like we were the guys that stormed those beaches. They were so thankful to America and to us as service members 
and man, that how that made you feel was so incredible. You know, I didn't do that. You know, I mean, I served in combat in Iraq, but that was a, a very different war. But it was remarkable that these people hold that point in history and they keep it alive. They teach it in their school. And I had a conversation with a, a number of folks, but this one guy in particular was, we were talking about how things are in America right now. And it, again, this was in 2019. So this was before, you know, COVID and everything that's happened culturally, you know, in the past year and a half. But I did share with him, I said, you know, America is very different. We don't have an appreciation of history like other cultures do. We we kind of live in the moment and we move on. You know, that's just kind of the way things are. Uh, you know, good, bad, indifferent. But I said, it's amazing that you guys are coming and sharing your stories with my brother, uh, my brother-in-law and me. And I said, it really means something. And uh, he said, well, you know, I, I can see why you Americans are the way you are. That you can understand history, but then you kind of move on and you don't maybe hold it as tight as we do. And he said, I believe why is because you've never lost your freedom. You don't know what it's like to be free and then not be free. And you Americans came twice. You came to our shores twice to liberate us in the First World War. And then again in the Second World War, and all the things that America stands for, and all the goodness that you guys bring to this world, you're not, no one's perfect. But that really hit home because I think he has it right that us, you know, us Americans today have no concept of not being free, of not having the liberties, not having our form of government, the things that we just take for granted. And we are good neighbors. We're imperfect, but we're good neighbors. And as long as we continue to strive to be that, you know, America is going to be a good thing. And I'm thankful. And I thank God that I'm an American. I think about it a lot, about being alive at this time in the history of the world, to be who I am, where I am, living in America. I, I, I couldn't be more thankful. Awesome. Yeah, I always get a little anxious personally when like I'm a big first amendment guy freedom of speech and freedom of religion even when I don't agree with the speech or the religion I'm just because it's one this is one of the few countries that has that freedom I mean for crying out loud I mean I I I mean you you get a very short list when you talk talk about countries that have that have freedom of religion and freedom of speech in the first article of their uh, of their amendments you know of the the constitution that's rare air i mean we are at high altitude there uh when when we talk about that i uh i fear that we're moving you know my prayer is i think we're moving to an era of com of restricted speech and religion and, and not only that compelled speech and religion. And when I go back through countries, like, like their history of having compelled language and, and compelled beliefs, I just, uh, oh Lord, don't let it be, let us not go the way of all countries, you know, of all eras. So anyways, I, I could go for days on this. This is my, you know, it's one of my favorite topics and I, you know, and, and politics, we'll, we'll bring politics in. If you don't talk about religion, don't talk about politics. Politics has made two words, curse words, and that's liberal and conservative. Those are both some of the greatest words in our human, in our, in our English language is, is conservative and liberal. And, and, and we've turned those into curse words. And I, I don't like that. I, you know, I, I just, I love those two words because one is saving so I can do good. And the other one is doing good from what I've, what I've managed to conserve uh, and, and sharing with others. And so, yeah, uh, love God, neighbor and country.
That's wrong. Who's jumping in? Anything on the tip of their tongues? So, um, okay, I'll jump in. You know, Ron talked about uh, the parable of uh, the Good Samaritan as being something that was central <clears throat> to his discovery, you know, in terms of his faith or his knowledge of God or how he saw his calling. You know, for me, uh, as a Navy lieutenant, I was in the middle of a crisis losing a marriage that I'm still in very happily and just celebrated 34 years. But I went through the refiner's fire. And I remember one day I read a passage of scripture and I didn't, I grew up Catholic. I didn't grow up with the Bible and I didn't know the Bible at all, but I read with a group of guys, I read this passage in the, in the book of Hebrews chapter four, um, verses 12 through 13. I'll do my best to capture it, but it's the word of God is living and active sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. You know, nothing in all creation is hidden from God, but it's laid bare in front of him to whom we must give an account. And I remember reading that passage and I'm not, this is not being melodramatic. I'm being very honest with you, but I remember feeling like a flood lamp was on me and everything up to that point that I had done was exposed in front of me. No one else saw this, but this is what I had felt. And, you know, through a series of discussions, I was coming to grips with where I had, where I had been, you know, and, and I loved at that time success far more than I loved people. And I'm sharing that for a reason. You know, because when I think about the 4th of July, I think about the founding fathers, I think about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I think about core values. I think about ideals. My heart didn't have enough in it to fulfill those things. Ideals are great and values are great and mission statements are great. But if the human heart is not in, a, in its rightful place, um, we'll never bring out the best in ourselves. And, and so what I felt like, you know, what safeguards this idea for me of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for me, what allows me to fulfill that is a standard that's greater than me. And that is the, the word of God and the spirit of God that has led me forward. And I think about, you know, the passage that I want to share is in the book of Luke chapter four, you know, Jesus goes into the synagogue, they hand him a scroll, he opens up the scroll of Isaiah, and he basically said, you know, the spirit of the Lord is on me. I'm here to proclaim good news. You know, I'm here to set the captives free and I'm here to give the blind their sight again. And then he rolls it back up and he sits down and he says, and by the way, I'm fulfilling that passage right now. <laughs> it was just a great, great moment in the, in the gospel, you know. And I, I think, you know, that's for me how I look at when I think about the country and I think about how grateful, like Scott, I mean, I'm overwhelmingly grateful. And I, my wife and I talk about, you know, we watch these Netflix miniseries. We just got done watching one, The Last Kingdom, about the Danes and the Saxons. You know, I wouldn't, wouldn't have done well in an era where I could have got an ax to the back. Um, I'm so grateful that I live where I live now and what and what God has been able to do in, 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 in the time frame. But you know, I think that's that's the, the 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 calling for me. You know, and the lens that I look at is, you know, the spirit of the Christian faith is that we are capable of lifting up other people up and out of difficulty. And I would even go further to say that what makes the Christian message so compelling is that, especially in the face of the fact that there are a lot of people that are very different than me and us in this country. And for me, the faith has been able to create the tipping point to get past my own biases, my own weaknesses, and really my own self-centeredness, because left to myself, I'm a super selfish human being. Uh, but God has filled something inside of me that's allowed me. And for me, that was the tipping point. I, I knew that my life changed when it became more about caring for people than it did just being successful. And so... You know, that's, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fired up. My wife and I and our daughters are going to go to Chattanooga. We've got some friends that we help become Christian, Christians back in New York. And uh, we're going to celebrate 
Fourth of July together and, and you know, probably go around a circle and talk about what we're grateful for and, and maybe even wrap our, our, our faith into that. But we, we still got about 12 minutes. I'm not rushing the call. I'm certainly not going to put a hard stop on it if somebody wants to put their heart out there, but would love to hear from you guys. Any other thoughts on this celebration through the lens of your faith or just even just sharing where you're at right now, just to be a part of the conversation? So maybe I'll, I'll, uh, I'll jump in. <laughs> um, I will say that um, I, I value freedom too. Uh, I'm, I'm a French citizen. <laughs> um, and I know how we are, uh, a lot of this freedom is being uh, um, slowly being eaten at. Um, but I, I, I uh, resonate with a lot um, um, with what just you shared uh, uh, about um, the freedom in Christ that we have, that means the freedom from sin, the, the, the way our heart is free to become a citizen of heaven, and that means uh, um, brother and sister, more than neighbors, <laughs> um, where we, we, we have uh, uh, the blood of, of Christ that link us to one another. And uh, when I was thinking about the parable of um, the Good Samaritan, the Samaritan was an excluded one. He, he didn't belong. Um, but in his heart, he belonged. Because in his heart, he had love. And he had empathy. And he had compassion. And he, and he, he had the heart of God for that other person. Um, and uh, I think the, the verse that I've been uh, thinking uh, about when uh, um, when, uh, when it comes to this parable was uh, uh, Colossians 1, 9, where he said, for this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And, and um, I'm saying that because I think the biggest way to love someone is to pray for them. Because when you pray for them, you put them in God's hand. You don't force, you don't try to manipulate, you don't try to get your way. You really, um, I, I do believe that there's a, a huge power in, uh, in, uh, in uh, praying for the healing, praying for the, for the uh, change of heart, praying and keeping people on, on our heart. So that, that's, that's what came in, in, um, in thinking about this parable and about uh, freedom, because I'm not naturally free. Naturally, there's some neighbors that I have a hard time, but then I pray and God change my heart. And so, and then I am, I'm in a different, uh, I have different disposition towards them um, because I do believe that uh, we can be changed by uh, consistently by, by his uh, he, Christ in us. And, and the real hope of glory is Christ in us. Love it. I feel compelled to uh, share something here real quick about uh, the title of this is where mission and faith kind of align. Uh, and I can remember as far back as I can think of maybe being five or six years old and going to a baseball game and hearing the national anthem. And to this day, I can't tell you why, but every time I hear it, it makes my skin with my goosebumps. It resonates inside me. And it is not lost on me how lucky I am. Let me reemphasize that. Lucky that I was born to be an American. And for all of the stuff that we've talked about with military folks and things, I feel that it is my duty to pay God back, America back for what I've been given, the opportunities I've been given. There's privilege here, and that's the privilege of being born in this country that we've all kind of uh, been blessed with. Um, and, and, and like most of you, I, I, there's nothing that I wouldn't do for it. Um, and, and again, back from an early age, there's, there's a couple of things that have a profound impact on my life. And I, again, I couldn't tell you why. I remember I was in seventh grade um, in a history class. And we were opening up our history books and we were talking about the civil rights era and things like that. And there's this picture that stands out to me. I can see it clear as day as I'm talking about it. There was a black officer, I think it was Birmingham, Alabama, wearing his blue police uniform, standing in front of a bunch of Klansmen who were doing some sort of rally, preaching how they wanted to kill all these black Like everybody else, I don't know how wrong that is. But the first thing that came into my mind is like, how can that guy stand there and let that be a 
okay? How can he defend these evil people, in my opinion, uh, spew this hatred? But I remember saying from that day that I hope that I could be, I hope that God gives me the presence and self-awareness that I could be as professional as that man as he stood there that day. Um, and I've really tried to live my life that way. Uh, you know, and I think that is what we've talked about through um, Scott and his, this former call and some of the things we spoke I think to be effective, right? And that's what I love about this, to get your perspective and to learn from, uh, you know, we all have gone through Syria and out of the military, some of us. And I start to, you know, it's easy to go down that rabbit hole of cuckooness, uh, that little black hole of self-doubt. Um, and one of the things that I, I kind of go back to is, Sometimes I go back to that picture that I remember, and sometimes I go back to looking back down range and, you know, anybody that's been to Iraq or Afghanistan or close and see how some of these people lived in, I'll call it like fifth world countries. And I see these kids playing and families that are in these war-torn countries, and they still have genuine happiness. They have real smiles on their faces. They still have love. And when I look back at those things, God's able to, you know, kind of shine that light on me and be like, hey, remember back then? How can I really ever be complaining about anything in my life when somebody that's in that kind of life can find true happiness? Um, and that's kind of just where I want to leave that is that, you know, God's given us this ability to talk about these things, to um, share our lived experiences so that we can have some different perspectives, uh, so that we can all kind of choose to be happy and choose to follow the, the path that he set forth for us. Uh, and that's really all I've got. Thank you. Good stuff, Chris. I'm just going to jump on again. Thank you, Chris, for that. But thank Joel for and Sarah for this. It's uh, very interesting that it took me back to when I was 50, I decided to study in uh, Greece. I went on an archaeological dig with a bunch of 20 year olds, but um, I did a bus tour and uh, to Mycenae. And we crossed over at uh, Corinthia and it's like, what's ingrained to us, like growing up Christian and, and stuff, but just going across that, that bridge, it was like, oh my God, like the history here, that this is where the letters to the Corinthians were written. And like, just to be able to be there to just even, there's so much power in that, like, Scott talked about history of America, but this is our history from way back. Like, it, it, there's so much history there that, uh, yeah, I just have to share that. That's perfect, Janet. That, yeah. that history is our history. Uh, one thing that before we go, I so prior to studying that Samaritan story, I identified with the uh, the pious people walking on by. And then after that story, I identified with the man in the ditch and Jesus was a neighbor to me, you know, to, he was despised and rejected. The Samaritan was despised and rejected in that era by the religious leaders. Jesus was despised and rejected and he rescued me from a ditch that I couldn't get out of. And that was the ditch of sin and, and, and misery and set me back up onto a path. And I, you know, I, he, even to the point of his own death on the cross, I mean, you talk about being a neighbor to someone who was helpless and broken and in a ditch. I mean, that was me. Um, I, you know, I love God. I love my neighbors. Uh, I don't, I'm not as good at not loving them as myself, but I, 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 that is my, my real life goal there. And then love my country is, is, a, is an outgrowth function of loving God and loving my neighbor. So Jesus was, he, he was the good Samaritan for me. So I don't know if that's sacrilegious calling Jesus a Samaritan or not, but, but I think he was the rescuer along that road of someone who couldn't get out of the ditch on his own. And that was me. Yeah. And so there you go. Love it. 
Well, just to be sensitive to time, we're going to land the airplane. Um, and, uh, you know, I want to piggyback on what Ron said. And, you know, in terms of my identity now, you know, I identify as a Christian first. And then I'm a husband and then I'm a father. And then I'm an American. And I don't think in any way that makes me any less patriotic than anybody else. I mean, I love my country. I've served my country. I even tried to go back into the military, <laughs> but I, I couldn't get in. I was too old, for the, at least too old for the role that I wanted to do, para-jumping school. Um, but I think, you know, as we land the airplane here, you know, it is just food for thought, you know. I mean, I think it's a really, it's, a, it's an interesting testimony when we think about the country was framed on men that had a vision that, you know, a lot of scholars believe was formatted from, from the word of God. Um, and it's just interesting that as I opened up, you know, the, the conversation that, you know, the, the, the only sad note of the, of the contemporary narrative is that there is just too much of an emphasis on this individual expression. And I think, you know, that's the cool thing I love seeing are, you know, it's almost countercultural right now to fight for unity and to fight for having all these disparate pieces to come together and find common ground and ideals and not be, you know, not be issue centered. Um, but, you know, I, I leave us on that note that I think there to, to be patriotic is absolutely a high calling. Um, but I think to serve God and to know God and to serve him for, for the Christian is the highest calling. And I think when we order it properly, it would make us far better, far better citizens of this country. It's the, for me, it's the only thing that's going to safeguard my, me against being self-centered because, you know, before I became a Christian, freedom meant getting to do what I want to do. You know, now freedom means, you know, fighting, loving other people and, and, and wanting them to be successful and, and, and wanting to succeed for the other's benefits. So anyway, thanks for coming. Um, we could close out with a short prayer. Love to have uh, another discussion. Some of you that didn't get a chance to talk, please don't be offended. It's not because we didn't want to hear from you. We just really want to respect the time frame that we were uh, given. Uh, and of course, if any of you have any thoughts to share with anybody, share them. Or if you want to share something with me, my email is in the thread. I'd love to hear from you and, and continue a conversation, whether it's personal or public or otherwise. I'd love to connect, completely open to connecting. So um, with that, let's see. It, did Baya jump? On, is she still on the phone? Looks on like phone? she had to jump. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Sarah, would you close us out in a, a short prayer? <clears throat> sure. Okay. Um, Father God, thank you so much for this time. Um, just hearing from everybody's hearts, from their life experience, from their just their gratitude of the things that um, really bring us back to the way that we've been created. And that is uh, really, truly to love, to build up, to support, to connect, to uh, unify. Um, it, it's just been an incredible day. And I want to just thank Joel for this particular segment to um, just spear leading another just edifying and encouraging talk. And uh, I love you and I pray this in Jesus name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you.